Hello, I'm Ron Hughes. I'm the Senior Reliability Consultant for the Reliability Center in Hopewell, Virginia. I want to welcome you to this presentation on a case history where I served as principal analyst for a haul truck fire that occurred on one of our clients' vehicles up in Canada and was analyzed using RCI's PROAC methodology. Let's first start by looking at some of the facts of the incident. During operations, the haul truck operator noticed a fine mist of hydraulic oil beginning to spray on this passenger's vehicle side window of his cab. When the fine spray turned into a continuous stream of pour, it caused mine operation and reports an oil leak on his haul truck. Shortly after making his report, a backhoe operator in the immediate area calls him up and says, your truck's on fire. So he shuts down the truck, exits the cab, goes to the ground, and activates the fire suppression system, releasing the fire retardant in an attempt to put out the fire. When he was dismounting the truck, he did get injured. His right arm, his hand, his ears, and his hairs were singed from the fire that was beginning to engulf the truck. So fire rescue team and other emergency personnel show up. They put out the fire using fire suppression water and chemicals and apply first aid to the haul truck operator. Now when he exited the truck, he came from, of course, the driver's side around the front here and down the passenger side ladder. This is where he received his injur injuries and this becomes significant because we need to know the path of the fire in order to trace where this fire came from. And if you look here, you can see this V pattern here where the heat has affected this truck and it's pointing towards kind of the center of the vehicle. And also notice that the heat was significant enough to deflate the tires on, the, on this vehicle. If you look at the uh, driver's side of the vehicle, you notice that the heat wasn't quite as significant. However, the V-path continues to point at the same place. So this is a pretty good indication where we may want to look for either our potential heat source, our potential fuel source, or both. When you get up here, this is, this is the window where the operator first noticed the hydraulic oil spraying on the vehicle. There was also some a little bit notice on the back window here, but you can see the heat up here, and it was significant enough, fortunately, after he got away, that it destroyed the cab of the vehicle. So let's look at how we analyze this problem. Okay, we have an IMSHA reportable incident on the Unit 26 hauler truck. And our observed anomaly, of course, is a fire on the Unit 26 rig. Now, for any fire, you have to have the trifecta that makes a fire possible. That being an oxygen source, a fuel source, and a heat slash ignition source. Now, there are only two potential heat sources. And that, of course, being the operating environment of the truck itself in the mine or it could be something on board the truck, the pneumatics of the truck. Well, we checked the pneumatics of, for the pneumatics of the truck. We review the OEM's drawings and specifications, and we find that there really are no components or systems on the truck that could have provided the oxygen source for this particular fire. So it is the ambient conditions or operating environment of the truck. So we're going to go look, and we're going to look for the heat ignition source. Now, there's three potentials for this. The ambient conditions, which we determined to be inadequate to ignite the fire, or it could have been like an external heat source, maybe welding or flame cutting operations that were going on in the mine. After interviewing the appropriate mine personnel and reviewing any work order histories and that type of thing, this haul truck was not in an area where there were any operations going on that could have provided a heat source that would have caused the fire or ignited the fire. So that only leaves heat sources from the haul truck components. And there are two major types of components that could have provided a heat source, electrical or mechanical. First we look at the electrical. Now there is some significant damage to the wiring of the haul truck and to the electrical components of the haul truck. However, the damage that we see, we determine to be a result of the failure, definitely not a cause of the failure. If we look here, we can see some of the wiring damage that's a result of the failure. And if we go down here, let's see, 24. 
You can see some more of the wiring. Now let's go look at the batteries. Here's the batteries. You see the battery terminals have been affected. The uh, terminal cables have been affected. Again, all of these components have been affected by the fire, but did not cause the fire. So let's go look at the mechanical components. And there are two major mechanical components that could have provided the heat source for this fire. Now turbochargers on haul trucks are notorious for starting fires on haul trucks or providing the heat source for fires on haul trucks. So that's the first place we look. We inspect the turbochargers. The turbochargers have seen some heat. However, there is no evidence of ash or anything else on the turbochargers that indicated that this was the initial heat source for this particular fire. So our only other place to look is the exhaust system. We inspect the exhaust system and we do find an area where the fire has started and that's at this area in here. This is ash here. Now what makes this interesting is remember our V patterns that I showed you on the outside of the truck. This is right in the center of the truck and this is exactly where those V patterns were. Also, I'm going to be showing you here in just a minute, the fuel source is over here, right next to this, and again follows that V pattern. Now, what's significant about this is I'm standing by the passenger side door here, looking down into that area of the haul truck. That's where I took that picture from, from this point right here. Now notice this is an open path, a completely open path that allows spray to hit the cab. That accounts for that. It hits the cab and it hits the back window of the cab. And you can see the cab has really been subjected to some, to some very significant heat. This is right behind the cab. Okay, so that answers that. Now let's get up here and we're going to go find our fuel source. So where can our fuel source be? Well, it's either external or internal. There is nothing external going on around mine operations that could have done this, so it had to come from the inside. And there are five potential heat sources. That being the hydraulic fluid, the engine oil, the diesel fuel, the lubricating grease, and the DC wheel motor gear lube. The DC wheel motor gear lube remained intact throughout the incident, so it could not have provided the fuel source for the fire. The lubricating grease. Now the lubricating grease, we do see, for example, some indications, this is the grease reservoir, where the grease was attacked by the fire. However, in other areas of inspection we find the grease to be the tea color that we expect it to be, and the grease system itself is still full. So it did not provide the fuel for the fire. The diesel fuel now, diesel fuel, we inspect the entire system. And for example, here's the fuel tank. The diesel fuel system has, has remained intact throughout the entire incident. However, it's empty. The entire system is empty. And we can account for that by the fact that this was subjected to severe heat and the diesel fuel was literally boiled out during the fire but the system's intact, so therefore it did not supply fuel for the fire. The engine oil, the engine oil system is inspected. It remained intact throughout the system and the engine oil is found full, so therefore it was not the fuel supply. A hydraulic fluid system, a hydraulic fluid system is found to be empty. We inspect the hydraulic tank. The hydraulic tank is intact and therefore didn't rupture. However, the hydraulic system is empty. So we look for problems with lines, hoses, and fittings, and also hydraulic valve problems. Now we inspect the, the valves. All the valves remained intact throughout the incident. However, the threaded connection where the discharge oil cooler solenoid valve mounts on a nipple, it, there's a problem there, and we're going to take a look at that. So hydraulic lines, hoses, and fittings. The valve itself didn't fall, but a, a fail, but a threaded connection did. So we inspect that either we've got ruptured or broken hoses and piping. Got a lot of damage to the hose and, hoses and piping 
However, again, this is a result of the failure, not a cause. Or we could have loose or disconnected fittings. So we inspect that and we find a problem on, on the discharge connection of the oil cooler solenoid valve. And this problem is literally, this valve has come off. Here's the valve right here. This is the nipple that it mounts on. Now this valve has literally come off and it has come off during operations. This is us setting the valve back up there very carefully so we don't destroy the evidence. This is the as found condition of the valve. Okay. And that, of course, is our fuel source. So we got loose or disconnected fittings due to this open connection on the discharge side of the old cool cooler solenoid valve. Now, how can that be? It's either not picked up during pre-op walk-around inspection, became loose or open during operations, or was initially open. All right, to begin with, if it, if it was initially open, this would have provided a steady stream of hydraulic fluid that would have been easily picked up during the pre-op walk-around because it would have been a large puddle of oil on the, on the ground. However, the operator did not pick it up during the pre-op walk-around inspection, so it was probably not loose. It was probably loose, but not very, uh, not real loose. So it wasn't initially open, and he didn't pick it up during the pre-op walk-around inspection to begin with, because you can't see it. You, when you do walk around the outside or the exterior of the truck, you cannot see the interior of the truck, and this is right in the center of the vehicle. So it can't be seen from the truck exterior. All right became loose during operations. We believe this to be true because he didn't pick it up during the pre-op. So evidently it was threaded in just enough to hold pressure until it became loose dynamically. And it became loose during operations because of the design deficiency because of two factors. First being there's no support for this valve. That's the first factor. The other factor is the threads don't have any type of coating, such as a Loctite, that you would put on a threaded connection when you expect it to see some type of dynamic loading. In this case, there is no uh, threaded Loctite on there or any other type of sealant on there that would have sealed it during dynamic loading. Not supported. This turns out to be true. Again, there's the valve. You can see there is no mounting bracket or anything for this valve. And you can also see here that this was fairly loose when the operator initially began operating this truck. Now what has happened here is this, this just became loose during operations. When the operator initially did his pre-op, it may have been weeping or seeping just a little bit, but there wasn't enough being released to allow the operator to notice a pool of hydraulic fluid under his truck, which you would have seen. So it was initially, we'll even say seeping, and finally began to work itself loose. This allowed a fine sprayer mist to go up and hit the cab side of his vehicle. Now eventually, as during operation, continuous operations, this becomes looser and looser. And finally, it comes off. When it comes off, the hydraulic oil now is producing a steady stream, which he notices and reports to mine operations. So essentially, what we got is an inadequately supported uh, oil cooler discharge valve that became loose during operations that allowed an open dis uh, connection to this discharge side of the oil cooler solenoid valve that allowed the hydraulic fluid to escape and provide the ex internal fuel source for the fire that occurred on the Unit 26 rig. Now, again here's our heat source and here's our fuel source and again you know that remember where we're standing so this is the failure here. As a result of this failure, our client decided to inspect the rest of his fleet and see if this, there was a potential for this failure occurring to other rigs. We did find some other rigs where this fitting was beginning to come loose. 
and of course that was taken care of immediately. Also a bracket has been designed and is beginning to be installed on these haul trucks that not only holds the oil cooler solenoid valve during operation, keeps it keeps the dynamic loading from negatively affecting it, but even if the failure should occur. The design of the bracket is such for this valve, it's meant, going to be right here, that should it become loose, the oil will be deflected straight to the ground. It not only deflects it straight to the ground, it prevents it from going in this direction either towards the uh, exhaust pipe or the turbochargers, so it keeps it away from the heat sources. So even should this failure occur again, after the brackets are mounted, it should be easy to detect and it should be, it should, you should be able to save the rigs before they catch on fire. I want to thank you for coming and you're welcome to come back and visit us at www.reliability.com and look for future presentations. Thank you.